Hello everybody, welcome to Unit 3 Biology Area of Study 2. Today we are going to be looking at the regulation of biochemical pathways in photosynthesis and cellular respiration as an overall. Um, there will be a couple other videos that are specific on photosynthesis and specific on respiration as the study design dictates. Um, but today we're going to be looking at sort of the pathways, we're going to be looking at the role of coenzymes, and we're going to be looking at enzyme function and how that can be impacted by temperature, pH, concentration, and then looking at inhibitors as well. So we'll make a start. Um, basically, the two main biochemical pathways that we explore in Unit 3 Biology is photosynthesis and respiration. So we need to understand our reactants and our products of these processes. So we need to know how to write the worded equation, um, but also knowing how to write it in molecular form. So for photosynthesis, our reactants are the same as our products of cellular respiration. Okay, so almost if we learn one, it might be easy to remember the other. So with photosynthesis, we have carbon dioxide and water. Um, with some light energy and some chlorophyll, allowing the creation of glucose and oxygen. Now, these are formulas that have been balanced. Okay, so we've got six in front of the carbon dioxide, six in front of the water, and six in front of the oxygen to ensure both sides are um, balanced. But we also need to know that this is the finalized way to write it. Okay, so we haven't accounted for the fact that there's water on both sides, that water is a reactant and a product as well. Um, and then cellular respiration, we can see that it's glucose and oxygen, and then our byproduct or well, our products are carbon dioxide, water, and ATP, which is adenosine triphosphate, our energy. So we really need to know what our initial reactants and our final products are for that. In terms of coenzymes, coenzymes basically assist enzymes in the catalyzing of reactions, okay? So they are crucial to a lot of these biochemical processes, um, things like NAD, NADP, ATP, they're all coenzymes that you would have heard of that basically help enzymes build or break down whatever their substrate is, okay? So they play a critical role in um, these enzyme-catalyzed reactions. We also have what we call the cycling of coenzymes. So you may have heard of um, like ATP and ADP, where we've lost a phosphate. That comes into accordance here. So we're looking at the loaded and unloaded forms of moving energy of protons, electrons between the reactions that are happening in the cell. Okay. Coenzymes themselves um, are used during the reaction. And so it's helping, it needs to be replaced before the next substrate basically comes in but um, they do provide a critical role. You can see here an example of where they link. So we might have our enzyme, we then have our coenzyme that fits into the active site, okay, over here, and then our substrate is able to bind, okay? So it allows for that to happen. Many of these enzymes need additional non-protein components, okay? Um, and these are called cofactors as well. So that's a word that you might come across when you are looking at this unit. In terms of factors that might affect enzyme activity, we know that enzymes are biological catalysts. So they are used to sort of speed up the reaction or, um, you know, reduce the activation energy that might be required for a reaction to occur. And there are a few things that can affect the activity of enzymes. And they are these four that we've got here. So temperature, pH, enzyme concentration, and substrate concentration. So in terms of these affecting photosynthesis and respiration, if these are changed, then your outcome of those metabolic processes are going to be changed as well. So with temperature, a low temperature basically means that the enzymes are going to be pretty um, low activity or really inactivating. Um, as we increase the temperature, that's going to increase the kinetic energy of the molecules, okay? And so more molecules moving means more colliding with one another, and that will increase the rate of reaction that's occurring. But we will then get to a certain amount of um, temperature, which is beyond our optimal temperature, and that's where our enzyme is not going to be active anymore. And that's where we say that it reaches the state of denaturation. Okay, so that's where it changes that 3D structure of the enzyme. 
and it can no longer function, it loses its function. So we kind of have inactive, yes, we get to the optimal, and then no activity, okay? pH basically works kind of similarly to having a high temperature. So if the pH is too low or the pH is too high, okay, so it's lower or higher than the optimum, that will also denature the enzyme. So pH works within a narrow pH um, range to affect the enzyme, and each enzyme works best at a particular pH level. So too low, too high will um, denature the enzyme. As for enzyme concentration, as the concentration of the enzyme increases, the rate of activity is going to increase, okay? So more enzymes will mean as long as there's substrate there, the reaction will increase. Whereas substrate concentration, you know, the addition of more substrate initially is going to increase the rate of reaction, but if there is a set amount of enzyme molecules present, the rate of reaction is going to taper off, okay? So once all of the enzymes are occupied, we can keep increasing the substrate, but that's not going to increase the rate of reaction. So it'll almost plateau uh, in terms of the rate of reaction occurring. So an initial increase, and then it'll plateau. And then finally, we have enzyme inhibition. So inhibition can be split into two categories. There are two types of inhibitors. Um, and that is irreversible inhibitors and reversible inhibitors. So an inhibitor is basically a molecule that's going to bind to the enzyme and that's going to reduce the activity, okay? It's going to interfere with the enzyme in some way. So we'll start off by talking about irreversible inhibition. So irreversible speaks for itself. It can't be reversed, okay? So the compound basically binds to the amino acids, okay? and it will alter the structure of the enzyme. And we know that if it alters the structure, it's going to affect its active site. Um, this is apparently going to inhibit the enzyme, and it can therefore not be reversed. So compounds like this might be poisons. So example, cyanide, okay, that will alter um, and affect the electron transport chain, okay, which will stop the production of ATP. We've also got penicillin, which can inhibit enzymes involved in the formation of bacterial cell walls as well. So irreversible inhibition means that it's irreversible. Reversible inhibition, however, um, means that the enzyme is not permanently inhibited. So it's just inhibited for that particular amount of time that that inhibitor is um, attached. So it only inactivates for a period of time. They're basically able to dissociate from the enzyme and then it can be active again. So there's two types of reversible inhibition and they are competitive and non-competitive. So competitive inhibition is basically where we have our enzyme, we have our substrate, okay, and we know that our substrate binds at the active site of the enzyme. If there is another molecule that is competitive for that same location, that is what we're calling our competitive inhibitor. Okay, so it's an inhibitor that will bind at the active site, which is going to stop our substrate from being able to access that active site. Okay, so it's directly blocking that active site, which means that reaction can't occur. Non-competitive inhibition, however, we've still got our enzyme, we've still got our substrate. That substrate active site is still empty, but the inhibitor binds to an allosteric site. It binds to a site that's not the active site, and that sort of changes the shape of the active site, which means our substrate will no longer directly fit. Okay, so reaction, even though the substrate active site location is free in the enzyme, that substrate cannot bind anymore. Okay, so no reaction is going to occur there either. But once both of these inhibitors, whether it be the competitive inhibitor or the non-competitive inhibitor are removed, then that substrate can fit in just fine again. If you have any questions related to looking at the overall pathways, looking at coenzymes or looking at factors that affect enzyme activity, um, please leave anything in the comments below and I'll happily answer those for you. Have a lovely day. Bye.